Hi, welcome to Samaritan's Porsche International Health Forum. We're so glad uh, that you're joining us today. We hope you participate in our conversation today. Um, I want to remind you that you can chat with us in the chat box beside the video. Um, before we begin today and I introduce our speaker, let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to come and to learn. And Lord, I pray that you would be with our speaker today, that you grant her uh, wisdom and your words and um, that you would give us ears to hear today. And Lord, we pray for all our technology that it would work today. And uh, we thank you for this opportunity to uh, just come together. In your name we pray, amen. Um, <clears throat> I wanna welcome this morning, uh, Dr. Christina Francis. Uh, she is a board certified OBGYN who currently works in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, I learned uh, earlier today, she has a former uh, SP post resident and went to Caps War Hospital. So I think that's important to note too. She has a long history of serving with Samaritan's Purse uh, and we're thankful that she's here with us today. Um, to give you a little more information on her, she uh, completed medical school at Indiana University in 2005 and completed her OBGYN residency at St. Hosp Vincent Hospital in Indianapolis in 2009. She is the chair of the board of American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians Obst uh, and Gynecologists and is a board member of uh, Indiana Right to Life. Dr. Francis offers her medical expertise, knowledge of bioethics and pro-life reasoning both here in the US and around the globe. And so um, we're excited to have you with us, Dr. Francis. If you will begin your presentation, I know that we have a lot of listeners that are um, eager to hear what you have to say today. Sure. Thank you so much, Beth. I'm, I'm very glad to be here with all of you today. Um, I wanted to just start with a little bit of background of what brought me to this work. Um, as Beth mentioned, I was a post-resident with Samaritan's Purse, as maybe some of you who are listening are as well. And I um, uh, went to Capsuar Mission Hospital in 2009 through Samaritan's Purse and did my two years there. And then Came back to the US uh, just for a time of collecting cases for my boards and switching sending agencies with the goal as it had been for many years uh, to go back to Kenya long term. And um, I was telling them earlier that if you would have told me even six or seven years ago that I would be in the States, I would have told you you were crazy. <laughs> there was no way that I was uh, ever going to be living and practicing in the States. But it was during that time uh, that I was here in the States that I became uh, challenged by a very close friend of mine to look a little bit closer at the issue of abortion and the issue of the unborn. Um, she very wisely said to me, Christina, you are a believer, you're a woman, you're an OBGYN, and you say that you're pro-life, but what are you really doing to save the unborn? And it was um, really a significant challenge to me and made me start to think about what was I actually doing? Yeah, I said that I was pro-life, but what did that mean? And as I started to look into the issue more, I realized that not only is this an issue that significantly impacts women and children here in the US, but also around the world. And it really was an opportunity to combine um, my passion for international work uh, with my um, newfound passion for uh, saving and defending the unborn. And what I realized in, in kind of changing my track a little bit was, that really my ultimate mission and the mission that I was that I was living out was really still the same. I think all of us are in this to protect and promote the health of vulnerable populations. And that's why we do what we do. Um, and I just can't imagine a more vulnerable population than that of the unborn. And so that's what I wanna to talk to you guys about today. Um, just the evidence that we have of um, how harmful abortion actually is for women. And then we'll talk a little bit about the unborn as well at the end of the presentation. So. So that's a little bit of history on me. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So um, for our CME today, just I'm not gonna read through these, but these are the objectives uh, for today's talk. I don't have any conflicts to disclose to you today, and hopefully we can um, get through all of this and give you plenty of time for questions at the end. Next slide. So when we look at the complication rates for abortion, they're actually really difficult to determine with certainty. And there's many reasons for this. Um, one of the reasons, at least here in the US, is that not all states in the US have mandatory reporting of abortion rates or abortion complications. So even the true rate of abortions in the US is difficult to determine and certainly 
Um, in other countries, especially developing countries, it's going to be almost impossible to determine the actual rate of abortions that are occurring. Um, the other reasons that it's difficult to determine the complication rates is that many abortion providers don't manage their own complications. In the U.S. especially, many of them are practicing out of independent clinics, and the when women have complications, they don't see them back for those complications. They just tell them to go to their local emergency room. And so because of that, then the information that they've had an abortion often isn't conveyed. Many times women are ashamed that they have um, made an abortion decision, and so they don't report that to the physician that they're seeing. And so it makes it very difficult to actually determine complication rates. Um, but but in the numbers that we do have, um, just looking at some various countries in Canada, when they looked only at abortions that are performed in hospitals, so this wasn't looking at independent clinics at all, they had about a 4.5% complication rate. Other uh, European studies showed anywhere from about a 35 up to a 9% complication rate. Um, in Great Britain in 2000, which really is the last time they've reported an abortion complication rate, their complication rate was about 11%. So as you can see, it's kind of all over the board, but not insignificant. Um, and the complication rates that we see with medical abortions, especially hemorrhage, are four times greater than that of surgical abortions. So um, if you're looking specifically at a population that's mostly undergoing medical abortions, your complication rate is going to be higher. Next slide, please. So just talking a little bit more about that, probably most of you know the difference between this, but when we're talking about medical abortions, we're talking about abortions that are completed through medications that women are given. Um, this may vary a little bit depending on what country you're in, but in general, uh, women are gonna be given RU486 or Mifepristone and then told to take Mesoprostol or Cytotex uh, 48 to 72 hours later. In some places, methotrexate is used uh, for abortions. This is also used, as many of you probably know, for ectopic pregnancies. Um, but in general, most of them are going to be a combination of RU486 and mesoprostol. Um, in Kenya, where I worked and, and still maintain a close relationship with those that are working at Capsuar Hospital, they're really seeing an increasing illegal use of just mesoprostol alone, which induces uterine contractions. So they're seeing this being sold. Um, on the black market being sold um, outside of hospitals by clinical officers for women to induce their own abortions. And they're seeing a lot of complications from this. Typically, um, medical abortions are used up until about, um, they should only be used, if you're looking at complication rates, they should only be used up to seven weeks of pregnancy in the US. The FDA just approved them up to nine weeks, uh, despite a significant increase in complications after seven weeks. Um, surgical abortions are going to be either through vacuum aspiration, if it's very early, a DNC or a DNE, which is a dilation and evacuation, um, which is typically used more in the second trimester and is more of a destructive um, procedure. You do have a significantly higher failure rate with medical abortions than with surgical abortions, so up to a 16% failure rate. Um, and this risk of failure increases the higher the gestation of the pregnancy. So next slide. All right, there are certain risk factors that are gonna place women at a higher risk for complication than others with abortions. Um, so if they're very young, so under 20 years of age, they have up to a 17% complication rate in some studies. The important one I think, especially in developing countries, is that women that live in rural areas, I think for obvious reasons, have a much higher complication rate. Um, and at least in Kenya, those, um, those are the women that are often illegally using um, mesoprostol for abortions. The method of abortion um, can put them at a higher risk, which we're going to talk about. Their parity, so either if they're nulliparous or no previous pregnancies or um, they're high parity, then they're at an increased risk of complications. If they've had previous induced abortions, their complication rates are gonna be higher. And then the higher the gestational age. So um, if you go beyond 12 weeks, they get a, a up to a close to 30% higher risk of complications. Next slide, please. So there's different um, kind of two basic categories for timing of abortion complications. The first would be immediate. So these are gonna be at the time of their surgery or the time they take their medication through just a few days following their abortion. 
And then the second category would be long-term complications. And these can occur weeks, even up to years out from their abortion. And we'll talk about each of these uh, in turn. I think one of the things that makes tracking abortion complications so difficult is that they don't all occur at the same time. So they're not all gonna occur immediately. Like I said, some are gonna occur years out and they're not necessarily gonna be linked back to a woman's prior abortion, even if she's honest with her provider about having had that abortion. Um, but even those that occur years later can be life altering um, for these women. And so there are important complications to take into consideration. Next slide. So looking at um, immediate complications that can happen, um, I've listed them here. So hemorrhage, infection are gonna be the two biggest ones, but there's also, also a risk of uterine perforation, cervical laceration, something called Asherman syndrome, which is um, intrauterine synechiae or adhesions inside of the, inside of the uterus, um, retained tissue, a failed or incomplete abortion, and then um, rarely it can also lead to hysterectomy. So we're gonna talk about each one of these now. Next slide, please. So when we look at infection risk, um, there's about a five to 10% infection rate that's reported. And the typical uh, bacteria that you're looking at are gonna be um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas, and then mycoplasma genitalium. So obviously uh, vaginal flora um, that, that are gonna be found in potential cervical um, infections, and this is why it's actually really important that women who are undergoing abortions have STD testing prior to it because it's going to put them at significantly increased risk if they have an undetected infection that goes untreated. Um, so this increases their risk of, of PID or pelvic inflammatory disease from instrumentation of the cervix mostly, but also even if they have a medical abortion, they can be at increased risk for this. Um, as you can see, other risk factors um, that would increase their risk of infection would be if they have a previous history of PID, um, no previous deliveries, so they're going to need more instrumentation and dilation of their cervix, and then if they've had previous induced abortions as well. Um, one of the techniques for inducing an abortion are laminaria placement. So these are um, seaweed uh, uh, laminaria that are placed into the cervix and then as they absorb cervical fluid they forcibly dilate the cervix and there have been case reports of bacteremia as well as toxic toxic shock syndrome that have been reported associated with laminaria placement for abortions um, this is a significant issue um, because about 30 percent of abortion related deaths are going to be attributable to infection. So it's something that um, if you're seeing a woman who's post-abortive, especially in the immediate time frame after her abortion, you need to have a really low index, or I'm sorry, a high index of suspicion, um, you know, a low threshold for treating because these can become very serious infections very quickly. There are a couple other um, uh, pathogens that have been indicated in cases of sepsis that that women have developed after abortions and that would include um, clostridium as well as group A and B strep and E. coli as well so there's really a wide variety of pathogens that can cause infections with abortions next slide the next immediate complication would be uh, uterine perforation so this is as the cervix is being uh, forcibly dilated with a surgical abortion that um, the uterus is actually perforated. The Royal College of OBGYNs reports a very, very low rate of this, anywhere from 0.1 to 0.4%. However, uh, back in 1989, there was an article published in the American Journal of OBGYN that um, looked at patients that had induced abortions and then went on to have sterilization performed via laparoscopy after their abortion. So they were able to look at all of these women's uteruses um, right after their abortion had been performed. And they actually found about a one and a half percent uterine perforation rate. And it was a pretty small study, but I think um, small, or significant enough to show that, that probably the reported rate is underreported. Um, and oftentimes they found in this study, as well as it's reported in other literature, that these perforations went unsuspected by the surgeon. So nothing happened during the abortion that made them think that there was a perforation of the uterus. There was no increase in bleeding, so they wouldn't have necessarily suspected this. The problem with a uterine perforation, especially one that goes unnoticed, um, is that it can lead to hemorrhage, especially if it's a lateral perforation that perforates through the uterine vessels. It can lead to life-threatening hemorrhage in that case. Um, it can lead to scarring, which could impact future fertility um, and even require a hysterectomy, either for infection or for bleeding. Next slide. 
The next complication would be uh, laceration of the cervix, and this is much more common. So this occurs in as high as one in 100 abortions. Of course, we're talking about surgical abortions here. Um, most commonly in second trimester DNE procedures, uh, where the cervix has to be dilated to a much greater degree because of the size of the baby. Um, risk factors that are going to increase a woman's risk for cervical laceration, um, obviously if you're having to mechanically dilate, so really forcibly dilate the cervix, if they've never had a baby before, and then just provider inexperience. Um, there are several good studies now that show that this leads to a significantly increased incidence of cervical incompetence um, in future pregnancies. And you can see here that the risk is really exponential. So if a woman has one prior uh, elective AB, she has a 149% increased chance of cervical incompetence in a future pregnancy. You can see the odds ratios there. But what I really wanted to draw your attention to is look at the woman who has three previous abortions. She's got an odds ratio of eight or a 700% increase um, in her risk of cervical incompetence in a future pregnancy. Um, and for anyone who's not in the OB world and, and doesn't know what cervical incompetence leads to, this typically leads to loss of her baby uh, prior to 24 weeks. So prior in the States to the point of viability. And um, I'm currently working as an OBGYN hospitalist, and so I take care of a lot of high-risk pregnancies, and this is something that I've seen a lot of. Uh, we have these women who come in who need cerclages because of their cervical incompetence, and you go back into their history, and it is really, really common to find a history of a previous abortion um, that presumably has led to their, their uh, development of cervical incompetence. So this is a really significant issue, especially when you're looking in the developing world where there's very minimal resources for caring for preterm neonates. Next slide, please. All right, so the next uh, potential complication is uh, Asherman syndrome, and this develops following um, a curatage of a pregnant or recently pregnant uterus. Um, it can lead to abnormal menses in the future, infertility, or even recurrent miscarriage. Um, and the risk goes up again uh, after repetitive curatages. So there's about a 13% risk after her first abortion or first curatage. And third, it goes up to 39% if she has even just one more curatage done. So this is a significant uh, risk involved with surgical uh, abortions. And when they looked at uh, one study looked at uh, patient population, all of whom had Asherman's, and when they looked at each patient, 42% uh, of them had a history of an induced abortion. So there's definitely a significant uh, causality uh, between between abortions and Asherman's syndrome, which again is not gonna not gonna necessarily immediately threaten the woman, but when she looks at wanting future pregnancies, it's going to. Next slide. All right. So now moving on to the long-term complications. Um, and these are the ones that aren't necessarily as frequently reported, and it's harder to find in the literature, um, but there is good literature out there to support these. So the main ones are going to be preterm deliveries and future pregnancies, breast cancer, depression, suicide, substance abuse, and then infertility. And many of these contribute to significant morbidity and mortality, um, both for the woman and for her um, future children as well. Next slide. So we'll look first at preterm delivery. Um, the adjusted risk of preterm birth after abortions, again, like many of the complications, increases really exponentially with the number of abortions a woman has had. So if you look at women who have had one abortion, and um, we're talking about surgical abortions here, increasing this, this risk, she has a 27% increased risk. But even if you just bump up to two abortions, it jumps her, her risk of preterm birth up really significantly to 62% increased risk. Um, and the preterm births that we're talking about that are related to abortions aren't just a 35, 36 week preterm birth. They're the very preterm births. So those that are less than 32 weeks. And so these babies are really gonna face significant trials when they're born if they're able to survive. Um, their complications later in life are gonna be a, a lower life expectancy, cerebral palsy, chronic lung disease, retina of premature, retinopathy of prematurity, um, or neonatal death. And this is really, especially I think an important complication to know about in the developing world. Um, where I was at in Capsuar, really 
any baby born at less than 28 weeks had not a 0% chance of survival, but a really low chance at survival. We um, didn't even have CPAP, so all we had was oxygen. And so, um, you know, these babies that were born at less than 28 weeks oftentimes just didn't survive. And these are the preterm deliveries that we're looking at um, that are going to be increased in women with a history of abortion. So it's really a significant issue. And I think the thing that saddens me the most is that oftentimes women choose abortion um, because they're pregnant at a time that they're not ready to have children, they're not ready to start a family, but they're not women that are never going to want to have children and never want to have a family. And no one is telling them that when they make this choice, they're not only choosing to end the life of their current child, but they're also threatening the lives of their future children. And I think many women would make very different decisions if they, if they knew that that was a significant risk. Um, this is a well established risk. It's now proven by greater than 150 studies. And in, I want to say 2016, but it might have been the very end of 2015, um, a very large systematic review came out that looked at over a million women that also confirmed this increased risk of preterm birth. Um, so much so that ACOG, the American College of OBGYNs, is now finally acknowledging that there might actually be risks associated with abortion. So, and this is one of the risks that they're finally acknowledging that there is an increased risk of preterm birth in future pregnancies. Um, so again, this is only seen with surgical abortions, not with medical. However, the women found to be at highest risk of preterm births in their future pregnancies were women that attempted medical abortions that then failed and then had to be followed up by surgical completion. So if you're in an area where lots of women are using medications for uh, abortions, many of them are probably coming in with bleeding and requiring surgery to stop their bleeding. So these are gonna be the women that are gonna be at the highest risk. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention too is that the Institute of Medicine here in the States, which um, tends to go along with ACOG and what they say, um, also lists induced abortion as an immutable risk factor for preterm birth. So a risk factor that can't be modified, unlike smoking and poor nutrition and socioeconomic status, some of those things that you can modify those risks with abortion. Once they've had one, they have the increased risk. You can't do anything to modify that. So again, very significant risk. Next slide. So the next long-term complication associated with abortions is um, breast cancer. And this is um, somewhat controversial even in the uh, pro-life world, but hopefully I can show you that we actually have really good evidence that this risk uh, exists. So just starting with some basic background information on breast cancer and reproduction. Um, breast cancer is the leading cause of cancer death in women. It, we've known for a long time that it's increased in women with no children and decreased in women with full-term delivery. So there must be something about pregnancy that is protective uh, to women for breast cancer. We know that for each pregnancy after her first, a woman's risk of breast cancer will decrease by about 10%. And we know that childless women or women with their first full-term pregnancy after the age of 30 have a 90% higher risk of breast cancer. And again, these, these facts are undisputed. Um, you won't find anyone that disagrees with these. Um, so the very reason that um, pregnancies and full-term deliveries are protective against breast cancer is the same reason that some abortions can increase a woman's risk of breast cancer. So again, it's an important distinction. We're not talking about all abortions here. We're talking about very specific abortions, and we're going to go into that here in some of the next slides. Next slide, please. So um, the abortions that we're talking about are abortions that occur prior to a woman having her first full-term pregnancy. So if a woman has six full-term pregnancies and then gets pregnant a seventh time and decides that she um, can't have the baby and has an abortion, that abortion is not going to increase her risk of breast cancer. She's not going to get that additional decrease in her risk of breast cancer, but it won't increase her risk. So that's an important distinction to make. Um, the National Cancer Institute, even though they have continued um, publicly to deny that there's a link, actually stated in one of their publication, in one of their publications, as in previous studies, induced abortion was found to be a risk for breast cancer. So we now have 74 studies that show a positive association between abortion and breast cancer. 58 of these are statistically significant. So the vast majority of them do show statistical significance. And this includes 12 of the 13 studies that have been published since 2008. So since 2008, almost universally, the studies show a, a relationship here. Um, I just put one of the studies up here uh, 
several studies have been done in China because of their forced abortion policy. It's unfortunately become a very good place to look at the relationship between abortion and breast cancer. Um, and they have noticed a significant increase in their incidence of breast cancer. Um, so in China, a dose response relationship has been seen. So if a woman has had one induced abortion, she has a 33% increased risk of breast cancer. Two induced abortions, a 76% increase, and three or more, a 165% increased risk. So, um, so again, an exponential relationship and a significant increase in a woman's risk of, of breast cancer. Um, some of you, if you are talking to people about this, might hear, well, yeah, but there's been a lot of studies that didn't show an association between abortion and breast cancer. One of the biggest flaws with most of those studies is that they included all women with all abortions. So they included those women, like I talked about at the beginning, that have had previous full-term pregnancies and then had an abortion. We know in those women, there's not gonna be an increased risk of breast cancer. And so that threw off the numbers. So even in those studies though, when you pull out the subgroup of patients that had abortions prior to their first full-term pregnancy, all of those studies showed an increased risk of breast cancer in that particular population. So it really is a well-established link now. Next slide, please. So when we we look at what is it that causes this increased risk of breast cancer, we know that abortion, um, premature delivery, so deliveries that happen prior to 32 weeks, and second trimester, not first trimester, miscarriage, all increase uh, a woman's risk of breast cancer. And it's the same mechanism of risk for all three of these things. It's because all of them leave the breast with more places for cancer to start than it had when the pregnancy, uh, when the pregnancy began. Next slide, please. So if we look at this diagram, this shows the changes that a woman's breast goes through um, throughout a pregnancy. So um, before pregnancy, the first trimester, um, at end of the third trimester to 32 weeks, and then after she has breastfed and weaned her baby. So um, at the beginning, as you can see before pregnancy, her breast tissue is mostly um, type one and type two lobules. These are gonna be very cancer susceptible, the type one and type two. They're rapidly dividing. We know that rapidly dividing cells are the ones that are most susceptible to, to any kind of cancer. Um, and what happens, um, as anyone who's been pregnant knows, when one of the first signs of pregnancy is you get breast tenderness and you start getting breast enlargement, and that's because the breast tissue is starting to multiply and divide. Um, and the vast majority of that is still this type one and type two tissue. So again, they're rapidly dividing, so that's what you see present up until about 32 weeks of pregnancy. So you get this kind of massive explosion of type one and type two tissue. Then at about 32 weeks, um, the woman's body spikes in its production of um, human placental lactogen, and that induces a conversion of that type one and type two tissue over into type four tissue. And about 85% of her breast tissue will convert over to type four. Type four is a very stable type of breast tissue. So it's very cancer resistant. Um, and then when she breastfeeds and then weans, then the vast majority of her tissue gets converted to type three, which is the most cancer resistant type of breast tissue. So this is why we see the decreased risk of, of breast cancer in women who have breastfed because they've converted the vast majority of their breast tissue over to type three. The more pregnancies they have and the more times they breastfeed, the more of their breast tissue gets converted to type three. So this all makes sense. This is well-known physiology that is, um, that's well established. So I think when you look at this, you can see why if a woman gets to 12 weeks of pregnancy, and then ends her pregnancy abruptly, she's gonna be left with a lot of type one and type two tissue. If she gets to 20, 24 weeks of pregnancy and ends her pregnancy abruptly, she's gonna have even more type one and type two tissue. And so these types of tissue are gonna be at higher risk and more susceptible for breast cancer. Um, so the longer the gestation of the pregnancy up until 32 weeks uh, before the induced abortion, the higher the mother's breast cancer risk because she's developed, again, more places for cancer to start. The really unfortunate thing is that these breast cancers that these women are developing are the really aggressive kind of breast cancers. There's a higher percentage of them that are gonna be triple negative, which are much harder to treat, and they're premenopausal, which already puts them at a higher risk as well and makes them more difficult to treat. So not only is the abortion causing immediate complications, but it's potentially shortening her life later on as well because of, because of the potential for breast cancer. Next slide. The um, last one that I wanted to talk about as far as long-term complications um, go uh, from a medical standpoint is infertility. 
And this research um, admittedly is extremely limited due to a lack of an appropriate control group. Um, but we do know that there's an increased risk of PID from abortion about a, and anyone with PID has about a 10 to 15% risk then of developing infertility. Um, we know that there's about a 60 to 70% increased risk of tubal pathology after induced abortion. So that's gonna then increase a woman's risk of ectopic pregnancies in the future as well. And if you go down to the, the uh, last point there, um, especially if, if she has retained products or, um, or a pelvic infection that develops after her abortion, her risk is gonna be increased of ectopic pregnancy. And again, those women that have undergone an attempt at a medical abortion, then followed by a surgical ab abortion or a surgical completion are at the highest risk of this. Um, so they're gonna have even a tripled risk then of ectopic pregnancy in future pregnancies, which of course not only then jeopardizes that child's life, but also hers as well. Next slide. Um, finally, there's a, a well-established risk now between abortions and, and poor mental health outcomes for women. Um, again, this is not all women. Is every woman going to regret her abortion? Um, not necessarily, but we do know that there's a significant proportion of them that do, and then that leads to poor mental health outcomes uh, later on in life. So we see a much higher rate of depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and suicide in women and men, actually, as well, who have participated in abortion decisions. There was a large meta-analysis that was published in 2011 in the British Journal of Psychiatry that looked at 22 studies um, that were well-done studies, and they showed an 81% greater risk of mental health problems for a woman who had had an abortion. And the point that I actually found the most interesting is when they looked at all mental health problems that were found in these women, 10% of all of those problems were actually attributable to just an abortion alone, independent of any other risk factors. So 10% of these women only had those mental health problems, presumably because of this abortion that they had had in their past. So a really significant impact. Um, we know that the use of illicit drugs is six times higher in women with a history of induced abortion and suicide risk as well is six times higher in women who have an abortion compared to women who give birth. And this holds true even in the population of women who have um, quote unquote unwanted or unexpected pregnancies. So if you take even that subgroup of women, so not women who were trying to get pregnant and excited about their pregnancy, but women who this came out of the blue and it wasn't what they were expecting. If you compare those who choose abortion versus those who choose to go on and give birth, um, the women who chose abortion still have a six times higher risk of suicide um, at some point in their life. So really significant. The thing that I think makes, um, or I need to make a point of here as well, is that those of us as believers um, really have a significant ability to impact women who fall into this category. Not only can we offer them medical treatment for their medical complications or perhaps an antidepressant or something like that for the depression that they're struggling with, but we also have the hope and the healing and forgiveness of Christ that we can offer to these women and these men. And that really is the most important thing that we can offer to them, to, for them to know this is not an unforgivable sin. This is not something that they can't get past. It isn't something that Christ can't forgive. And so this is, I think, where we have the most um, or the highest ability to make an impact on these post-abortive women. Next slide. Um, so when we look at, again, medical abortions, I don't know what you guys are seeing and where you're at, but again, I know in Kenya where I was, this is something that's really increasing in frequency um, is the illegal use of medical abortions. Um, failure of medical abortions oftentimes leads to significant hemorrhage, which can lead to the need for surgery or transfusion or even death if they can't get to the hospital in time or if there's not blood available to them. Um, again, maternal deaths have been reported due to clostridium. Um, causing toxic shock. And this has been reproduced actually in rat studies as well. Um, the, they have a significantly higher risk of just adverse effects in general, even if they're not emergent um, side effects. So 29% of women who have medical abortions will have adverse effects as compared to just 4% for surgical. And you can see those listed there. Um, but significantly up to 20% of them are going to have significant complications that are going to require urgent or emergent evaluation and treatment. And so if you are working in a place where it takes women a long time to get to the hospital, which I'm sure is the case for many of you, um, this is going to be really a significant issue as they can lose a significant amount of blood or even potentially die en route to the hospital to be treated. Next slide. 
I hope I'm doing okay on time. This is one area that um, I really wanted to hit hard because this is something that um, the World Health Organization and the United Nations um, have really pushed is that unsafe abortion or abortion that is done really in a country where it's illegal is what defines an unsafe abortion um, has been labeled by the WHO as a significant contributor to maternal mortality worldwide. Um, they estimate that 13% of all maternal deaths are due to unsafe abortion and so their fix for that is that we need to make abortion safe and we need to legalize it and that's gonna fix this problem. Um, and it is a party line that has been adopted by many people, unfortunately. ACOG um, about three or four years ago came out with a statement that said childbirth is significantly more dangerous than abortion. And so because of that, we should really focus on making abortion safe. Um, this statement was based on incomplete and very flawed data, and I've listed an article in my resources by Byron Calhoun that does a really good job of going into detail on why the data is flawed. The other thing is that a lot of information on maternal mortality related to childbirth as well as abortion comes from the Guttmacher Institute, and this is um, the WHO uses a lot of information from Guttmacher, but I think it's important to know that Guttmacher is the research arm of Planned Parenthood. Um, and as we all know, Planned Parenthood is the largest abortion provider uh, in this country and also a significant provider of abortions worldwide. Um, Guttmacher is part of Planned Parenthood. Their goal is to produce research that will support the work that Planned Parenthood does. So it is inherently biased, so I would be very, very cautious um, about using any of their data other than perhaps just their reporting on the number of abortions that occur. All right, um, next slide, please. So let's look at a tale of two countries when we're looking at maternal mortality, both Chile and, and Guyana. So Chile um, has one of the lowest rates of maternal mortality in the Americas. And abortion has been uh, completely illegal there since 1989, although that recently uh, came into question. What they saw when they made abortion illegal is they saw a significant decrease in their maternal mortality. So that dropped their maternal mortality dropped from 41 to just 18 per 100,000 live births. So this is the exact opposite of what people would have you to believe happens when you when you um, make abortion illegal. Uh, El Salvador and Nicaragua, both of whom have made abortion illegal, have found similar things that their maternal mortality rate has dropped significantly. Next slide. So in Guyana, the other country that, that I wanted to compare, um, which is also in South America, they allow abortion on demand. Um, abortion was completely prohibited until 1995, and then it was made legal, legal on demand in Guyana. And in the same amount of time that Chile saw a dramatic decrease in their maternal mortality rate, Guyana's did fall, but it didn't fall nearly as much. So they saw a 32% decrease versus a 70% decrease in, in Chile. Um, Chile found that the greatest impact on their maternal mortality rate was increased education for women and improved access to emergency obstetric care as well as overall health care. So these are the things um, that are decreasing maternal mortality, not legalizing abortion. Next slide, please. Looking in Africa, um, South Africa in 1996 passed the Choice on Termination of Pregnancy Act, which is the most permissive ab abortion law in Africa. Abortion is still illegal in many African countries. However, South Africa actually allows abortion up to 40 weeks of pregnancy now, which is just mind blowing to me. Um, they saw their lowest maternal mortality rate from 1987 to 1989. So this was prior to the time that abortion was legalized. They only had 31.2 per 100,000 live birth uh, maternal mortality. This uh, mor maternal mortality rate has risen since the late 1990s. So it started to rise when abortion became legal in, in South Africa. They're now, look at that jump. They went from 31 per 100,000 live births to 112 per 100 live births. And that was in 2002. Um, so again, legalizing abortion has not proven in any country to decrease maternal mortality. I've got one more example on the next slide, if you can go to that. So in Poland, abortion was banned in 1989. And I think not surprisingly, look at these stats. Their maternal mortality rate decreased by nearly 76%. Their infant mortality decreased by over 60%. And their rate of premature births dropped by over 50%. Um, so they saw a significant improvement in their um, maternal and child health when they banned abortion completely. Um, and this really shouldn't come as a surprise when you look back at the risks that we've talked about that accompany abortion. Next slide, please. 
So what does decrease maternal mortality? Um, these are things that have been proven. Skilled birth attendants, improved education for women, emergency obstetric care, so access to C-sections and other um, emergency care like blood transfusions, things like that. Transportation, uh, community outreach and improved referral systems. So, you know, as, as people working in an international setting, this really needs to be the focus of our work, not improving access to abortion. That's not what's good for women. It's not what's good for their children. Um, these things instead are what we really should be focusing on, what the World Health Organization and the UN also should be focusing on. Next slide. All right, so why should we oppose abortion? Well, hopefully I've proven to you guys today that it's really bad for women. However, even if abortion was good for women, even if there are a million health benefits for women of abortion, we would still be morally obligated to be opposed to it. And the primary reason for that is because abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Abortion has no other um, primary intent. Its only intent is to end the life of that developing human being. And that's why, ultimately why we should be opposed to it. However, we also have on our side that it's bad for women. Next slide, please. So um, this doesn't go along with the CME, but I felt like it was really important to include um, as we're engaging in discussions with our colleagues and um, other people that we deal with in the healthcare realm, I really do feel like we need to be able to have a strong logic-based argument in defense of life. Um, you don't have to rely on scripture to say why you're opposed to abortion, even though obviously scripture backs that up. Um, but I just wanted to give you guys a couple really brief things that you could keep in your back pocket for when you are engaging in discussions about why abortion is wrong, um, things that you can fall back on. So the first is just a basic syllogism um, that really gets people to focus on the crux of the issue. So one of the things that happens when you're discussing abortion is that people like to take you off on tangents and offer up red herrings that are going to be difficult to talk about. But what we really need to do is come back to the crux of the issue, and that is who are the unborn. So our basic syllogism is, the first thing is, would you agree that it is wrong to intentionally kill an innocent human being? Most people are going to agree with you on that. Um, and then the next part of that is what is an abortion? Abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being. Therefore, abortion has to be wrong. So if you can get them to agree with you that intentionally killing an innocent human being is wrong and you can show them that abortion it does just that, it intentionally kills an innocent human being, then hopefully you can bring them around to the fact that abortion is wrong. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring out is um, just a really simple argument um, to combat things that people will say as to why it would be okay to kill an embryo or a fetus um, and not to kill you. So these are four just very basic differences between who you are now and the embryo or fetus that you once were, um, but not reasons, not morally significant differences, not reasons that would justify killing you then, but not killing you now. And an easy way to remember this is the acronym SLED, S-L-E-D. So the S stands for size. So obviously unborn children are much smaller than you or I are, but how does size equal value or worth? Um, my six-year-old niece is much smaller than I am, but that doesn't mean that I have the right to kill her because she's smaller than I am, just as someone who's larger than me has no right to kill me simply because they're a bigger size. The next difference between unborn and us are level of development. So obviously they are much less developed than we are. But again, my six-year-old niece is less developed than I am as well. But how does that mean that I have the right to kill her simply because she's less developed? Many of you probably work with people with physical handicaps or mental handicaps that people would argue they're less developed than we are. But does that mean that we are justified in killing them? No, obviously we continue to develop throughout the course of our lives. So you're always gonna find someone who's more developed or less developed than you are. The E in SLED stands for environment. So many people argue that it's justified to uh, kill the unborn because they're living inside of their mothers, but it's really just semantics. It's a difference in environment. Um, I often tell people my environment when I lived and worked in Kenya was drastically different than my environment here in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Everything about my environment was different but I was the same person there that I am here. Why is that? Because who I am isn't dependent on where I am, and it's the same thing for the unborn. Who they are isn't determined by where they're located at that time. They're still a human being, um, a full-fledged human being, uh, just like you or I, and so where they are doesn't change who they are. That 
passage through the birth canal doesn't magically convert them from a non-human to a human. They're human beings from the moment they were conceived. And then the D in SLED stands for degree of dependency. So this is a big one that you'll hear um, that people say, well, they're completely dependent on their mothers and so therefore their mothers should be free to choose to do with them what they, what they want um, because they can't survive apart from their mothers. Well, again, just being dependent on someone or something else for your survival doesn't mean that you have, that you're less worthy of life. So um, I often like to use the example of a dialysis patient. They're completely dependent on dialysis for their survival. If that dialysis machine breaks down or if they have no access to dialysis or for those of you working in developing countries where you don't have access to dialysis, those patients will die. They are completely dependent on that dialysis machine for their survival. And yet I would not be justified in walking onto a dialysis unit and shooting and killing every single one of those people simply because they're dependent on something outside of themselves for survival. Why is that? Because they're human beings and we can't kill an innocent human being um, and not be held responsible for that. So, um, so again, these are four um, very basic differences um, and very real differences, but they're not morally significant differences. So none of these justify killing the unborn, but not killing us now as born human beings. Um, I'd like to leave you guys um, on this part with one quote from a man named Greg Kokel, who's a pro-life apologist, who said this, and I think this just sums up why we oppose abortion. If the unborn are not human, then no justification for elective abortion is necessary. However, if the unborn are human, then no justification for elective abortion is adequate. So again, I think that just emphasizes the importance of coming back to the crux of the issue that these are human beings, both the unborn and their mothers, and as such, we are morally obligated to care for both of them. If you want more information on pro-life apologetics, I'd recommend the book Case for Life by Scott Klusendorf. It's a really, really good primer. It's easy to read um, in really solid pro-life apologetics. Um, here's my resources. I just wanted to point out to you the fourth resource on there. The tech, it's a textbook called Complications, Abortion's Impact on Women. And it's a really good synopsis of all the studies that are out there. They're difficult to find on their own. And so if you can get access to this book, it's a really helpful book to have. Um, and then the two websites that are on there are just there for, for your reference, for future reference. Um, APLOG, the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs, exists as a professional organization to support you in your practice of pro-life medicine, and international members can actually join for free. So if you're interested in becoming a member, um, I'd encourage you to, to go to the website. Um, if you're practicing internationally, again, it's uh, free dues. So, so that's all I have. I think we are um, have time for questions and answers. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Francis. This was um, just a really good presentation and um, just very powerful um, to hear the, the statistics. And, and um, as, you, as you talked about it, 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 at least it motivated me to want to be more involved in the pro-life movement. And um, I hope that it does that for our viewers as well to see the um, just importance um, of, of being part of this and standing for life. Um, I think sometimes it can be a, a silent battle Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, um, sure. especially here in the U.S. We don't hear about it or maybe we don't see it or maybe we turn our, um, our eyes from it. Um, right. But right. I, I hope that this really um, brings motivation to our hearts today. Um, and I thank you for the work that you're doing in that. So I just want to remind our viewers, um, if you do have questions, to please post them in the chat on the side box and uh, we will get to those. I know Dr. Francis would love to answer those for you today. Um, I want to just start off with one, Dr. Francis, on, sure. um, I've heard a little bit about, I, I'm from Wisconsin, and so I actually uh -huh. follow Wisconsin Right to Life, <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. and uh, I saw something uh, posted recently um, about a hotline that women could call um, should they have had a medical ab or a abortion mm -hmm. um, and a reversal drug, and I just wonder if you could enlighten us a little bit on how that works, and um, yeah, just tell us a little bit of detail about that. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So that is the um, actually the abortion pill reversal network, which I have a, the privilege of being a part of. And I've actually had a successful one successful abortion pill reversal, one attempt and one success. So and I got to deliver her baby, which was probably That's one of cool. the most joyous deliveries I've ever done, I think. <laughs> so um, yes, yeah, so this is available um, right now in the US. Canada is just starting and um, the UK has it. 
and there might even be one starting in Australia actually. So it's for women who take the first pill of a medication abortion and then regret their abortion decision and want to try to save their baby. Um, so if they've taken the RU486 but have not yet taken the mesoprostol, if they've taken the mesoprostol, they can attempt it, but the success rate is less than 5%. So they're counseled appropriately about that. Um, but if they haven't taken it yet, then actually, so the way RU486 works is it's a progesterone antagonist. So it binds to progesterone receptors and blocks the action of progesterone, which is a crucial hormone in early pregnancy and the development of the placenta and in implantation and um, several other things in pregnancy that progesterone helps support. And so the treatment for it is you actually flood the woman with progesterone, essentially. So um, there's a few different um, methods of or forms that you can administer the progesterone in. For anyone who's overseas, who's perhaps seeing women who um, have uh, access to RU486, uh, probably the easiest form is vaginal uh, progesterone suppositories, and they use those um, nightly for uh, the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. And um, we, so far, there's a, a paper that's getting ready to be published that's going to report on over 300 successful reversals. And the success rate in that paper is about 65 to 70%. So women are appropriately counseled. This is not 100%, but we have a good chance of of being able to save your baby. So um, if anyone is interested in that, you can actually go to abortionpillreversal.com and you can see about either becoming a network provider or uh, perhaps having access to the protocol for being able to do that. So it's a really exciting development and a chance to be able to save some of these babies. We know, like for my patient, she said the second she left the abortion clinic, she knew that she'd made the wrong decision, but she'd already swallowed the medication. So she thought, she had no other choice, but she went home and Googled, can I reverse my abortion? And that's how she got connected to me. So it's pretty exciting. Wow, that that is uh, exciting. And uh, what a life-saving uh, drug and right. um, what a life-saving thing to be a part of. I bet that was an amazing delivery uh, really to amazing. be a part of. Yeah. Um, so is the main, um, for people to find out that information, is it is it mainly through just Googling, can, you know, can I reverse this? Or is there other ways that, you know, we can get the word out about um, sure. Sure. Um, well, I mean, if, that. <laughs> I mean, if if Samaritan's Purse or, you know, through this through this email chain would be willing to circulate the that website, um, mm -hmm. that would be amazing. So it's just abortionpillreversal.com. But on the website, then is the network phone number. So sure. what happens is if if a woman decides that she wants to try and reverse her abortion, then she calls the hotline, which is staffed 24 seven and gets through to one of the network nurses who then talks to her and kind of assesses whether or not she is even a candidate for this and then gets her um, connected to a physician in her area who's part of the network. So, mm -hmm. um, yes. And actually one of our board members at APLOG is the medical director for the abortion pill reversal network. So we work very closely with them. Wow. Well, that, that is really neat. Well, we can certainly put that when we send out our follow-up email, um, yeah. we can include that, um, Dr. Francis in the, um, follow-up email so people can have access to that information that they can share. Um, and That'd make people more aware of that because that just seems um, like a really good thing to to know. Yeah, to for sure. Um, uh, we have another question here from Ashley, and she says, "Have you found if there is any uh, significant impact for women deciding to have an abortion or not based on her support system?" Um, so, is there any association between the support system and um, impact on women deciding? Sure. Or not. Sure. Well, I mean, certainly that is a reason that many, many women give for choosing abortion is because they just feel like they have no support. Um, for me, when I'm talking to patients who come to me and saying that they're considering abortion, that's actually usually one of the first things that I start with is just to ask them, can you tell me your reasons that you're thinking about choosing abortion? Um, because a lot of women see them as insurmountable when they're actually not. Because at the time, obviously, they're in a crisis situation where they're facing something really overwhelming. And we all know when we've been in those kind of situations, you can't see the forest for the trees, right? So you just feel completely overwhelmed. And while I haven't been in that particular situation, I certainly have been in overwhelming situations. So that's usually where I start when I'm counseling patients and talking to them is tell me why you're considering an abortion in the first place. What is it that makes you feel like this is the right choice for you? And then if they express that they have a lack of support, um, then you can address that. So I don't have hard numbers on that, you know, as far mm -hmm. as what number of women choose abortion because they, they 
feel or perceive that they have a lack of social support. Um, but I know it certainly is is very high. And obviously, depending on what cultural context you're in, that's going to be addressed in different ways. But I think it raises a very important point that we as the church have an obligation not only to defend the unborn, but also to support these women that we're encouraging to continue their pregnancies. So this is an amazing area. I know where I worked in Kenya, um, the church still has significant influence. And so one of the things as I've gone back and done more pro-life speaking um, in Capsuar is I've talked to the women's groups at the churches and talked about you know, yes, I know it's not ideal when a teenage girl in your church shows up pregnant, but instead of condemning her, we need to support her. And and here's what we can do to help support her so that she can um, continue to move on with her life as well as, you know, give her child the best potential outcome as well. So I think it's a good, really good area for the church to be involved in, for um, mission organizations to be involved in, is showing these women that there is actually support out there for them and they don't have to choose this detrimental choice um, simply because they have a perceived lack of support or maybe, you know, a, a real lack of support, but, um, but here we can provide this support for you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, can you speak just a little bit more about um, maybe give us some, some numbers on uh, the amount of medical abortions versus surgical abortions that are performed is one more common than the other? Um, yes. Yeah, so I have numbers for the States um, mm -hmm. as far as other countries, I'm not sure, but in the States, sure. Um, surgical abortion still uh, is more common than medical abortion, but medical abortion is actually on the rise. So it's perceived as being easier. Women can complete it from home. It doesn't require surgery. It doesn't require anesthesia. So I think a lot of women and providers um, also kind of tout it as being an easier option. Um, so currently it's about 35% of abortions in the US are, are medical abortions and then the remainder are surgical. Um, but again, I think it's important as we're talking to women that they understand that it's not an easier option. There's again, a higher risk of complications. They're going to experience really significant pain, um, significant bleeding. And again, about 20 or 20 or so percent of them are going to require urgent or emergent evaluation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and then if you could speak to us a little bit too about in developing countries, I know your experience has been in, uh, Kenya, um, what kind of, uh, you know, I, f I feel like in the States we have crisis pregnancy centers that exist in uh, a lot of areas. Um, what do you see uh, in developing, in the developing world as resources for women, um, like a crisis pregnancy center or council? Who's actually giving these councils? Is there anything like that that really exists? And um, how do we go about addressing that need too? Sure, sure. That's a great question. Um, well, so again, my experience in Kenya, and then I also know um, of some people who have worked in Haiti where there was something similar, um, and in Romania where there was also something similar, but kind of the idea of like a maternity home um, seems to work well in those in those settings. I know specifically in Kenya, especially in the rural areas where I was, it's, it's very um, conservative in the sense of it's still very shameful to a family if their unmarried daughter becomes pregnant. And so there's a lot of social pressure for an abortion to keep it quiet, but also, or to take the girl completely out of school and have her at home. And um, then she may or may not ever return to school, which then of course has a really significant impact on her future. And so I have seen the, the model of like a maternity home for women or girls whose family can't support them through their pregnancy to be able to bring them into this home, still continue their education, provide resources for them, um, facilitate adoptions if that's what the, you know, if culturally that makes sense or if that's what the girl chooses or her family chooses or help facilitate kind of an improved family dynamic if, if the girl's going to return home to help them accept her and her child. Um, and so those, those types of things do exist. I think it would be, um, good for those to continue to um, increase in, in frequency. Um, again, in Kenya, I think it makes sense to do it through the churches because they, they have a really well-established social network through their churches. Um, and you can find a church in Kenya, you can find a church in pretty much every town. So it makes sense to do it through that. Now in another setting where churches aren't as common, it may not make sense to do it through churches. So obviously people will have to see what makes the most sense culturally in the place where they are. But um, I definitely think, you know, those of us in the pro-life world are often accused of only caring about 
women staying pregnant and then not caring about their children or them at all after they decide not to have an abortion. And I think that's a travesty. I don't think that that's true about most of us. Um, but I do think that we could probably do a better job of showing that we are in it for the long haul with these girls. And, you know, obviously preventative measures are ideal. So talking to girls about abstinence and, and, you know, preventing unwanted pregnancies and things like that is important, but we also need to have a plan in place for those girls that do become pregnant and supporting them and encouraging the, the boys and the men to be involved as well and not to abandon these women. So um, I think there's many avenues that, that could be pursued. Um, I think improving access to care is also very important because maybe one of their lack of supports is just they don't have access to prenatal care. Mm -hmm. So improving that is, is important as well. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Francis. This, again, has been a great presentation. I appreciate you taking time to answer our questions. And um, we will, you know, post your resources in our, in our email that goes out so that um, our viewers will have access uh, to those. And I um, want to thank you so much for your time today and doing this. I do want to remind people that CME is available for this presentation. And so if you will follow the instructions that you get, um, and fill out your uh, just your form um, and send it in. We will be able to give you CME for that. So um, our next presentation is February 14th. This was uh, Dr. Jeremy Fowler and uh, Casey Denier. And so I hope I said her last name right. Uh, but she will. She, they will be speaking with us next month. So we'll hope you will join us again um, on February 14th for the next uh, International Health Forum. Have a great afternoon.